Uh, good morning and um, thanks for joining us. We were just remarking, uh, depending on when you think the start date of the COVID-19 pandemic was, we are either at or quickly approaching the one year mark. Um, and uh, this is Gary Greenswig. I'm happy to be with folks this morning and um, uh, Tom McGinn, of course, and our guests, Dr. Ramsey Ulrich and Dr. Uh, Fidas uh, Shaib, who uh, Tom will introduce in just a minute. Um, this is um, a COVID-19 update slash grand rounds number four. And um, uh, we're happy that folks could join us this morning. And I know people uh, are, um, a few folks are still joining. We have a brief reflection. Uh, and I think um, since Tom is going to uh, drop off to uh, go to a vaccine meeting about halfway through, John, if you could bring up our reflection um, this is from the um, uh, American uh, Bishops um, uh, out Archdiocese uh, in Tucson, Arizona in December. Getting the COVID-19 vaccine is an act of charity supporting the common good. And I think um, uh, we all sort of think about it as uh, an act of protecting ourselves, but I, I think it's an act um, uh, as well of uh, protecting everyone else and certainly the common good. So uh, Tom, since you're off to a uh, vaccine meeting a bit later this morning. Maybe you can take that one with you. Uh, so with, uh, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Tom to uh, introduce our speakers and we'll get started. Great. Thanks, Gary. Um, you know, on that note, it, it's interesting. The data has shown that one of the big moves why patients go from hesitancy to vaccine is their sense of concern for community. Uh, which I think is really kind of heartwarming to me. I, it's, it's really a, a spirit of community that is driving people to get vaccinated. And I think as, as physicians and leaders, we need to tap into that spirit and pull people along in that vaccination path that we have. A couple of quick items. One is we are doing a great job and every one of our communities throughout the United States is vaccinating and the physicians and the physician enterprise and our APPs are out there giving vaccines. So I'm so proud of everybody and the hard work that we're doing. Um, I have talked to each, each of our regions to say, identify your denominator, your patients, um, and understand that you're reaching out to patients in need. Some of the older patients with mild cognitive impairment or in, in those that don't have that energy to get vaccinated, we need to be the one activating them to get vaccinated. <clears throat> the second thing I wanna say very quickly is, um, as the one year anniversary, <clears throat> excuse me, comes around, focus on wellness is critical amongst yourselves and, you know, and then amongst your, your teammates. And if you're, you're a leader, um, be cognizant of that, be deliberate about it, tell people to take days off when they need to. And, you know, we, we have to try to manage in this, uh, but be very conscious and deliberate about wellness. And the last thing I'll say that I think our, both of our speakers are going to talk about today, which is the years, I would say years in front of us are going to be managing the sequelae of COVID, uh, both physically and mentally. Uh, and I think we as a, as a provider enterprise need to be ready for this and organized that we're going to be doing this. And you know what, it's not going to be on the front pages of the newspapers. It's going to be what we just do every day going forward over the next couple of years. So I'm really excited to hear from our two speakers today. I don't know who's up first. Is Dr. Ehrlich up first or is Dr. Dr. Elric. Yep, Ramsey. Dr. Elric. Okay. So let me introduce Dr. Ehrlich. Uh, Dr. Ehrlich did medical school at USC. He was uh, did his internal medicine residency at UC San Diego. He's been a practicing internist for 22 years. He's had various roles in leadership and hospital medicine and residency training. He's been with Dignity the last few years. The reason he's with us today is to talk about his amazing effort that he's done uh, overseeing their respiratory clinic. Uh, in the Santa Santa Cruz area, right? Is that right? I'm, I'm never, what, what, what ocean are we on? Is, did I do that right, Ramsey? Ventura County. Ventura County, I'm sorry. I, I'm a New York kid, what do I know? That's okay. Um, our second speaker is, is Fida Saib, who is um, who did her medical school training at the American University in Beirut. She did her fellowship in pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine. By the way, as a prior chairman of the Department of Medicine, I know when you introduce pulmonary people, you always have to say, pulmonary, critical care, and sleep medicine. You have to say all three of them. Am I right, Vita? You have to do that, particularly. 
She is an associate professor at the Baylor College of Medicine. Congratulations on that. That's a major accomplishment. Uh, and she is the director of Baylor College of Medicine's Pulmonary and Sleep Medicine Lab. Her focus is in, in sleep medicine, one of my favorite subject areas. And she has been overseeing uh, the outpatient acute and post-acute uh, COVID clinics. And she's going to talk to us about her experience. I better stop talking and let uh, Ramsey talk. So Ramsey, take it away. Thank you, Dr. McGann. And I appreciate your words as pertains to the COVID vaccine and also uh, on wellness, which is so key during this time where there's such dynamic change and workflows and responsibilities and we're learning new things every day about this virus. So good morning, everybody. My name is Ramsey Ulrich. I'm a practicing uh, internist, uh, as Dr. McGinn mentioned, uh, with uh, Dignity Health and I've been running a respiratory clinic seeing COVID patients and uh, febrile illnesses for the last year. And um, I'm pleased to speak on uh, the, the topic of uh, ambulatory care COVID-19 follow-up, which uh, is uh, really a protocol that, that we developed in, in collaboration with, uh, with other individuals. And uh, I wanna thank Dr. Greenswag for uh, inviting me to, to have this talk. Um, next slide, please. So the rationale for uh, development of this protocol uh, and also to, uh, to the whole effort to try to manage uh, better the uh, uh, COVID-19 in the outpatient sphere, um, we wanted to create uh, tools and standardized protocols uh, to assist ambulatory practices in taking a more active role uh, in management of COVID patients. Uh, prior to this, I think it was acknowledged that it was mainly uh, a hospital-centric uh, uh, approach and, and ambulatory. Um, there wasn't a lot that we could offer. Uh, Dr. Greenswick has said multiple times, and I agree, that when a patient was diagnosed with COVID in the outpatient, we would often say, okay, you have COVID, um, uh, make sure you hydrate, self-isolate, and uh, if you get worse, call me or go to the emergency department. So um, part of this effort uh, was to uh, try to establish some protocols to, to better manage these patients. And the second bullet point there is uh, we wanted to, to focus specifically on the uh, high risk patients who did not require hospitalization by utilizing a number of uh, supportive treatments as well as latest development in therapeutics, for example, monoclonal antibody. Uh, and then the third bullet point there is because there have been major surges in the ERs and hospitalizations, we wanted to try to do our part to reduce the burden uh, on our uh, uh, hospitals uh, and our hospital colleagues. And then lastly, as Dr. McGinn mentioned, uh, to develop an evaluation management process for patients with late sequela of COVID-19. So on the right side of this slide, you see an org chart, and these are the various committees that uh, were set up. And I was the chair and the chair of the COVID-19 follow-up protocol committee. You can see there's also uh, committees on vaccine, monoclonal antibody, care coordination, uh, late sequela complications, HOMO2, clinical education, uh, communication distribution, as well as data collection. Next slide, please. So as I stated before, uh, the purpose of the protocol committee was really to, to, to have ambulatory care play a more active role in, in this pandemic. And um, I like to use the analogy of there really wasn't an algorithm or a clinical practice guideline for ambulatory physicians, primary care uh, clinicians. And so we developed something that was actually very, is actually very similar to the management of community acquired pneumonia, uh, where you're looking at uh, comorbidities, age, uh, to determine, um, for example, whether the patient needs hospitalization or what antibiotics uh, you need to use. And so, um, as mentioned, we would, our goal was to try to keep patients out of the hospital. And then lastly, a, to provide a framework uh, for outpatient clinicians um, because really I hadn't seen in the literature um, much on this. And so this was uh, uh, an effort to, to create something. 
Uh, so that could be used uh, by our primary care practices. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, uh, we set out to risk stratify patients based on the three items there, which are symptoms, uh, specifically dyspnea, as well as patient age and comorbidities. And we utilized uh, the available resources and therapeutics that were appropriate for each category. Next slide, please. So here are the resources that we currently have uh, at our disposal, and hopefully this will increase as uh, more therapeutics and uh, treatments uh, uh, come out. Firstly, and of course, what we're all now familiar with is video visits. Secondly, care coordination teams. Uh, thirdly, home care. And then fourth, uh, patient education. Um, this is both the, the COVID care guide that uh, Common Spirit uses, as well as CDC has a fantastic resource on uh, what to do when you are sick. Um, uh, next is monoclonal antibody infusion. Uh, and then last, uh, home pulse ox distribution in use. Next slide, please. So here is our algorithm. Uh, hopefully I'm able to keep everybody's attention here because I know it's a little bit busy, but let's just start off on it. In the left upper corner there, uh, are the comorbidities that we have all become very familiar with. Age more than 65, uh, obesity, uh, coronary disease, uh, chronic lung disease, uh, as well as immunocompromised states. And then in the right upper corner, you have a dyspnea evaluation tool that assists the clinician in determining, does this patient have mild to moderate, a mild, moderate, or severe dyspnea? based on whether they're short of breath at rest or with ADLs. So with those two boxes explained, you see in the center, once the patient has tested positive for COVID-19 or you're highly suspicious of the diagnosis, the first question that you're really asking the patient uh, is, are you short of breath? And if no, you see you go off to the left in the, that gray column um, in the non dysmic patient, if they don't have comorbidities and they're less than 65 years old, a relatively uh, a, a non-urgent video visit can be scheduled. You can see that the guidelines suggest perhaps in two to three days. Uh, and during the video visit, you're discussing with the patient um, education, warnings around worsening symptoms. You're providing them with the COVID care guide. And um, in that non-urgent you know, patient, you are considering follow-up with a nurse visit or a video visit in five to seven days. And you can see, I'm not sure if this is totally visible, but at the bottom it says follow-up until resolution of symptoms. And then after that, being mindful to screen for late sequela. So if that non dyspneic patient on the left, again, in the gray area, has comorbidities and is greater than 65, you see it goes into that green column where a more urgent video visit by the clinician is, is engaged. And different from the gray is that now you're actually screening, is this patient a candidate for monoclonal antibody? Um, and that's if the patient has been uh, symptomatic within seven days. Um, if they have a pulse ox, uh, confirm that it's greater than 90. Um, and uh, at that time, the clinician can engage uh, any combination of home care, care coordination, uh, and perhaps efforts to, um, uh, to, to get a pulse ox for the patient so they can uh, home monitor. And then you can see a video visit follow up in five to seven days. And then once again, um, see the patient till resolution of symptoms, mindful to screen for, uh, for uh, late sequela. Then we have the, the moderate patients in the yellow or orange column there who are offered really a, a more urgent video visit. So we get these people in hopefully the same day. Um, of course, we can offer them urgent care or ER evaluation, but we're mindful how busy the ERs are. Uh, the workflow in the moderate column is actually very similar uh, to the green column in screening for monoclonal antibody uh, and the rest that I mentioned before, but the follow-up for that patient uh, by the clinician is, is within one to two days video visit, and then the workflow is the same as below. 
Um, of course, in these severe patients who are quite dysmic, and you can tell these that they are um, because they're having trouble breathing on the video visit, they're using accessory muscles of inspiration uh, and so forth. Those patients we refer to the ED um, and after their ER uh, evaluation or if they're hospitalized post-discharge, we re-engage them uh, in the PCP office with uh, care coordination, home care, uh, home oximetry and so forth. Next slide, please. So I'd like to go through a case presentation of a 71-year-old male patient that I recently saw through a Zoom visit. His complaint was fever, cough, and dyspnea with exertion for five days duration. His SARS-CoV-2 PCR was positive five days, pro excuse me, four days prior. This patient did have comorbidities, including hypertension and coronary artery disease. Uh, his exam, the patient at the time didn't have uh, the ability to have to, to, to have uh, home vitals checked or pulse ox, but this individual was uh, speaking full sentences. He was not in respiratory distress, but he was occasionally coughing. My assessment at the time was that he had COVID-19 with mild shortness of breath, um, and I determined uh, that he was high risk to progress to severe disease and hospitalization because of his age and comorbidities. So at that juncture, I referred him for Bamlamivimab infusion, uh, and we set up a pathway uh, to do that in, uh, in our system. Uh, he was promptly referred to care coordination. Patient education was conveyed with specific instructions to self-isolate and warning around worsening symptoms. And then I scheduled a video visit follow-up with him uh, in five days. Next slide, please. So uh, back to the protocol, he, this individual would then fall into that green category where he had mild shortness of breath and I screened for monoclonal antibody and uh, activated uh, uh, care coordination, home care, and, um, and then uh, scheduled the appropriate follow-up. So I just wanted to show everybody how that would uh, apply to the actual workflow. Next slide, please. So in terms of follow-up for this particular patient, uh, he did receive bamlamivimab uh, the next day without complications. His Zoom visit five days later with me revealed that he was improving and no longer dysmic. He had a pulse ox at home, which revealed 96%. Care management phone calls that were frequent uh, documented improving symptoms and SATs in the 95% range. Um, I plan to continue weekly visits uh, with him on Zoom until resolution of symptoms and screening for late sequela. As a matter of fact, I just uh, did a Zoom visit on him yesterday. Next slide, please. So in summary, um, I have really uh, found that, that this tool that we developed in a collaborative manner uh, has been very useful uh, for me as a primary care clinician. Um, it has developed a rough framework for managing COVID patients in the ambulatory sphere using the resources and therapeutics that we have available. Um, one of the wonderful things about it, I think, is, is it's modifiable. And as COVID treatment evolves and more therapeutics become available, we can just change the algorithm. For example, if there are antivirals that come out or if primary care clinicians are perhaps going to uh, start using um, steroids in the outpatient sphere, uh, I know that's not happening at this time, um, but uh, we can just plug those changes into the, um, to the uh, algorithm, much like, uh, much like we do in community-acquired pneumonia when antibiotic resistance occurs and, and um, you know, uh, amoxicillin or just ZPAC alone is no longer appropriate. You have to use augmentin plus a macrolide or a respiratory quinolone. Um, next slide, please. Thank you everybody for allowing me to speak on this subject. Okay, great. Um, uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat that we will come back to. And Tom, I'm not, Tom may have um, gone off to his vaccine meeting. So Dr. Shaib, um, how about if we have you go next? Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I, I really want to thank uh, you for inviting me to this activity. It seems like it's a great uh, educational activity and allows people to share um, uh, ideas and, and what we're doing. So uh, following up on Dr. Ehrlich's um, 
uh, presentation, which I have to thank him because I built on his on his flow chart, our flow chart when we started looking at this. Uh, our our um, uh, practice is is really an, an inpatient pulmonary and outpatient pulmonary clinics. And since the pandemic started, we have been looking at ways where we can help our patients and keep them out of the hospital. And unfortunately, like most of, of you guys, we have I have lost lo lots of patients to COVID. And one of the questions that always came back was like, could I have done anything different? So um, we have been having lots of initiatives here at Baylor College of Medicine and in, in, in a collaboration with our colleagues at uh, Baylor St. Luke's. And uh, this is one of the new projects that we're working on. And essentially it comes to the idea that every time we have a surge, we have lots of patients coming into EDs, into the hospitals. The EDs are getting overwhelmed. The hospital is getting overwhelmed. Uh, our critical care colleagues are, uh, are also overwhelmed. So is there a way we can do something to help with um, uh, helping our, our colleagues and helping our patients? So we wanted to uh, come up with a model that allows ED physicians to triage and select patients who are uh, low risk for uh, severe COVID, who uh, still can go either way in their course where we can um, uh, get them enrolled into a program that will follow them up closely. So um, next slide, please. So came up with the clinic at home. We wanted to be a gentle name that is friendly to patients so that they will uh, uh, join. Uh, we want to give the patients a focused medical care, uh, those who were diagnosed with COVID, but trying to take care of them at home and counsel them and reduce the burden of non-severe COVID cases on the ED and on the hospital capacity. So uh, we have uh, had lots of discussions coming up with a protocol that uh, will allow proper evaluation and selection for patients enrolled in the program. Uh, we wanted to include patients who are at low risk for severe illness, for sure, and then enroll them in the uh, clinic at home uh, uh, project and send them home with pulse oximeter and oxygen as needed. Uh, I have to be honest, we have lots of discussions about giving patients oxygen and sending them home. And um, we, we decided that at the end of the day, this is something that's staying with us. We're gonna get overwhelmed on and off with surges and maybe now it's a good time to go ahead and test that possibility. So we have agreed to uh, take on patients uh, on supplemental O2. And, and I was one of the first people who said, no way doing this. But then when I hear about the surges and what the EDs are going through and what the EMS people are going through, I thought that wouldn't be a bad idea. <laughs> Dexamethasone also is a question. It came up in the discussions and we, uh, we let it um, uh, uh, as an option for the ED provider, depending on their clinical judgment. So that's something uh, also that we're gonna be looking at. Uh, next slide, please. The challenge has been with oxygen and how do we select patients? So we, we had different uh, references, including the emergency medicine um, uh, uh, recommendations, and we categorized people by oxygen uh, saturation. And we had category A where people are, uh, don't have, of course, they are not high risk for severe COVID. SAT is more 95. Patient will be sent home and asked to follow up with a PCP. And in case they don't have a PCP, we'll provide them a number to call and get a PCP. And Baylor has been doing this since the start of the pandemic. Patients call and they get uh, seen by uh, telehealth. Category B are patients who have a SAT between 95 and 92. Um, and who are going to be sent home with uh, the clinical guide that has been uh, 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 produced and with a pulse oximeter. And they are going to be enrolled in the home monitoring program. Uh, category C has been patients with 92 to 89%. Uh, uh, percent. Those are the borderline patients. Uh, 
uh, that do, they will go home, maybe on steroids, with home oxygen, since uh, insurance now is covering uh, O2SAT less than 92% uh, percent to give oxygen uh, to patients, and they will be enrolled in the program too. Uh, every other patient with lower SAS or comorbidities or high risk for severe COVID is going to be admitted. Next slide, please. So we, we, we wondered how often are we going to follow up those patients. This is a, a slide from uh, a great uh, article in New England about severe COVID. And we, we looked at from the time of uh, symptoms until a patient is diagnosed or uh, in the course, their likelihood of deteriorating and having more uh, severe pulmonary symptoms is at day seven after initial symptoms. So we took this as guidance to come up with our uh, frequency of visits. Uh, next slide, please. So this will be our, our protocol. We're going to schedule, the patient is gonna be referred from the ED. Um, they're going to be called and scheduled for five virtual visits. And the, if ED uh, visit is day zero, then we are seeing the patient on day one, day two, day four, day eight, and day 12. And patient is scheduled for those visits up front. The clinic is staffed by APPs who are, uh, we've, we've been lucky, we called for help and we got um, four APPs who are interested, who have great experience in COVID and uh, respiratory. And there is a physician backup. So there is a physician who's available for backup all day during clinic time for any uh, questions. Uh, we have standardized our assessment and management protocols. We have st uh, standardized our documentation and patient instructions. And we, uh, we will provide after our coverage for patient calls. And this is gonna be provided by physicians. Our doctors have volunteered to cover patient calls um, and after hours. So we're gonna be 24 hour uh, service essentially. Uh, we are working on getting the Epic Care Companion uh, activated for those patients. This would allow us to uh, uh, monitor patients and get live uh, feedback from them in case they need any help. Next. And thanks to Dr. Ehrlich's um, great work, we have built on his ideas to suit more what we are seeing. So the patient population that we're gonna be working on is going to be different from what he started with because those are people who felt sick enough to go to an emergency room. So we changed a little bit, but built on the same uh, uh, spirit. So we defined the notable and the right uh, upper hand. We defined what are the notable findings when we're looking at what are the things that are alarming, worsening dyspnea. And, and I agree, the video is great because we're gonna be seeing the patient. We're gonna be walking the patient during the visit, uh, worsening oxygen requirement, tachycardia and blood pressure if the patient has ability to, me to measure blood pressure, any events uh, that are concerning for um, more, more advanced disease, hemoptysis, change in mental status, and other factors. And we took that and, and, and we started with clinical evaluation uh, and look for notable findings. If the patient has none, then we continue to give them the same recommendation um, of at home, uh, follow up the COVID-19 care uh, guide uh, and continue co to conduct video visits. Here, the provider has the ability to terminate the, the course of visits if we think the patient is doing really well and doesn't need to be seen. And at termination from this clinic, patients will be referred to our post-COVID care clinic. So that also can be a virtual option where we follow up patients. And then we categorize the uh, findings on, on the visit into low risk, moderate risk, and high risk. Uh, we thought low risk are like decreased PO intake, decreased urine output. We can ask the patient to hydrate and other stuff. And those are the people we're gonna uh, keep in the clinic. We are going to refer them to a subspecialist if we think there is something within, within Baylor and continue the follow-up visit. The high-risk findings are easy also to, to uh, identify. So those are the people we're going to send them to the emergency room. And depending on how sick they are, either call 911 or refer um, to ED. 
Uh, we couldn't agree on what moderate risk is. So we said what is not high risk and what's not a low risk is moderate risk because this is gonna be more of a clinical uh, judgment call. And then we also in that included screening for monoclonal antibody uh, therapy. We're lucky to have uh, that available for our patients too. And we'll continue with the follow-up visits and the provider has the ability to add more visits as needed. So if their time interval for the next visit is not what we want, then they can add uh, more visits. And of course, noting that patient uh, management and decision-making is gonna be based on comorbidities, on age, on the clinical assessment and the oxygen status. So uh, again, um, there's not much literature about this. So we had to come up with an, with an oxygen SAT assessment protocol too. So uh, next slide, please. So we, we, we came up with this table and I think this is a very dynamic table. I keep on changing it because different ideas come to mind, but the point is looking at the patient saturation um, as another factor to determine what we're gonna do and, and decide uh, uh, what to do and putting that in perspective with how they look as far as respiratory uh, status. And um, uh, looking at O2Sats more than 92, not on oxygen, we're really doing well. Uh, more than 92 on less than four liters, we're doing good. If there's any concern, we'll, we'll shorten their uh, follow-up. But if they're needing more than four liters oxygen, we feel that they need to go and, and get evaluated again. Uh, Sats between 90 and 92% and the patient is stable. Uh, it, it depends on what we're getting, but maybe shorten the interval for follow-up to 24 hours. Uh, if they're um, on oxygen and needing loss of ox more oxygen, then we uh, any escalation of oxygen for us is going to be a concerning factor. And, and we're, we're going to learn as we go, and maybe we understand that this might not be an option, but, but we kept it that way. Worsening symptoms or distress, patients can go to the ED. Um, uh, or call 911 uh, if there's a uh, real worsening status. And we did this for less than 92, uh, but we're not taking uh, less than 90 saturation in that clinic and keeping patients there because it seems to be, especially it's gonna be a change from their baseline. We have no access to x-rays. We have no other access to any labs. So we, we're, we're doing it that way. This is being like an overcautious way of handling oxygen saturation. And, the, and, the, and the, uh, the reason we're doing it this way because we're gonna get patients from different EDs. It's not one location. We are gonna be open to different um, uh, EDs um, in different locations, uh, you know, some places I've never heard of. So uh, we wanted to be over cautious because we have to take into consideration where's the patient, who is the patient, and what kind of services are available in their community. Uh, but I, I, I feel that this is going to be moving, uh, a moving target. It will change with time as we get more experience. Next slide, please. So uh, definitely this pandemic has been uh, full of challenges and uh, in challenges, I see that full of opportunities. I think we're lucky to have a system that is supporting us to come up with new ideas and, and, uh, and implement them. So this is clinic at home for COVID-19 is really a pilot. We're doing that for three months. We are collecting quality and cost data. We're collecting data on patients and who they are and wh where they live and, and socioeconomic status and et cetera. And uh, we, we hope that we'll continue with this after we get the uh, pandemic under control for future disease management, could be for other kinds of, of uh, <laughs> uh, problems. Uh, we also um, uh, have the post-COVID care clinic. Uh, it's, a, it's a very um, multidisciplinary, multi-specialty care model. Uh, we accept any patient who's had uh, COVID uh, uh, with or without uh, symptoms even, uh, because patients are really interested in the long-term sequelae. Uh, in that uh, clinic, uh, we're, you know, we're hoping to uh, uh, take care of patients, triage them to the proper uh, specialties and collect data and develop more knowledge about this, uh, this disease. So I think this is the end of, uh, of my talk. Getting myself off of mute. Uh, let's see, Tom, are you back? 
I'm not sure if he is. Um, so I, I just want to say uh, to both of you, thank you. That was extremely great. And, um, you know, it's practical. It's, it's, it's probably not um, rocket science, but it's, it's a great approach. And, and I think that people, uh, both of you have thought through this very clearly and um, we are really happy to hear this. And I think our challenge now is how do we scale this? Um, there are a couple of questions. So I, I just want to say thanks. Absolutely great. And um, I know that the person's on the phone. Uh, in fact, here's a note from Regina Mudd that says, great presentations. Thank you very much. And I, I think that's the sentiment out there. Um, there are a couple of questions. Um, <clears throat> one, one question has to do with social determinants. And the first question is, um, uh, Dr. Ulrich, I would think in your case, you probably know your patients and have some feel for social determinants. Um, but um, Dr. Shaib, uh, people are coming from the ER, you may not. And so one is the question of how do we, how do we know, how do we find out? And the second one is, is that in our protocol, which we all had a hand in developing, we, we've pretty much... Um, uh, I don't want to say we've ignored social determinants, race and ethnicity, but we've sort of uh, sort of based it on their clinical findings. Are you short of breath or not? And what are your O2 sats and so forth? And, and do you think there's more of a role? Um, uh, we certainly have seen the healthcare disparities um, related to Hispanics and other people of color. Um, uh, we, we hear about it every day on the news. And so have we missed the boat there or should we have more focus in those areas? I can, I can comment on that. <clears throat> um, uh, one of the things that has really been helpful here is the video visits. And, you know, uh, Dr. Greenswag, you mentioned, you know, that I do know my patients, but I'm, I'm receiving a lot of referrals <clears throat> and seeing patients in person um, who aren't my patients. And uh, I am quite aware of the social determinants of health and, and Frequent video visits, frequent evaluations. I think that is so key uh, for all of our patients. And I think you mentioned a few days ago, um, you know, this is a new paradigm. Before we would lay hands on the patient, re-examine their abdomen if we're concerned about app appendicitis, um, you know, see them back in clinic. Well, we have the video visits now, and uh, we have a lot of the technology like HOMO to SAT, patients are buying blood pressure uh, cuffs and we know what their pulses are. And I think that, um, you know, I think that that clinical assessment <clears throat> for, for all patients, including those uh, uh, who may not have access uh, to, to healthcare as much as, as some others, uh, I think that video visit evaluation and care management and just touching base with a patient is just so key because it really is that clinical assessment that um, uh, you know will um, help determine what resources that patient needs. Yeah, and I can add to this too is that like those programs are more more like a reach reach out to a population that might not be readily available or willing to come to a doctor's visit that frequently and also allows us to evaluate the patient in their own environment which i think is very valuable for taking care of them um, and and also reinforcing the education about quarantine what to do and and all this so uh, this is the, this is why we're very interested in collecting data about who is the patient, where do they live, what zip code, and see how the response to that intervention is gonna be. One thing that I thought was interesting, um, uh, Dr. Shaib, do you schedule all of those um, video visits at once? I actually think that's pretty a good idea. Um, you know, it is nice to say, well, you're doing okay, come back in two days, but it's sort of like if you just get that done and say, okay, here's the schedule for the next two weeks, day two, four, six, eight, or whatever it is, I actually think there's some utility in that um, because it gives the patient some, some expectation of the care and provides the doctor with uh, or APP with a um, kind of a roadmap that they don't have to worry about every time. You can always cancel them if patients are doing well. I, I like that a lot. Um, one question was um, the time frame for using Bamlamimivab. Uh, uh, and I think there's... Um, Originally, I think it was five days from symptoms, but now it's up to 10. Any comments on that? 
Um, I can comment on that, and maybe Dr. Shaib can as well. <clears throat> uh, the Blaze trial, <clears throat> excuse me, Blaze one, uh, it had ten days, and um, and one comorbidity, i.e., age more than sixty-five or BMI more than thirty-five, or um, uh, fifty-five or older with hypertension or cardiovascular disease, um, and then all comers with diabetes, chronic kidney disease, or immunosuppressed. Um, my understanding is there was some concern, A, about the, the amount of bamlimivimab, which is our new tongue twister, uh, allotment to each center. And so I think there uh, it seems to be different guidelines, but there was some concern that there might be enough, so maybe restrict the criteria. Um, and then secondly, you know, there are some concerns about <clears throat> the data not being sufficient. And uh, for example, the American College, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, American Society of Infectious Disease has recommended against its use. Uh, the NIH has said um, basically that uh, the data is insufficient, you know, for or against its use. And so um, in any case, we're using what I call the seven slash two, that is to say seven days or less and two comorbidities to qualify. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, um, Dr. Uh, Shaib, um, you mentioned or on the slide was dexamethasone. And could you just talk, and I think you and I talked about that on the phone as well, but what are your thoughts? I think everybody has their pen ready, but <laughs> nobody's been willing to write it as an outpatient. What do you think of that? So, so um, and that was also like, that, this is an important subject. I think we're, we're thinking that uh, dexamethasone has to be given for every patient who's hospitalized. And the reason we put it in the, in the protocol as a question mark, it's a decision that is gonna be made by the ED physician. However, if we are thinking that this protocol is trying to decrease hospital, hospitalization of the <coughs> less severe patients, then they could have been a candidate for dexamethasone. So that's why we put it in our protocol because if, if we have lots of capacity and everybody can get admitted, those patients could have been admitted and given dexamethasone and we didn't want to take the, that away from them. Yeah. Now the challenges at home with monitoring blood sugars and side effects yes. is gonna be something that we would mm -hmm. need to, to learn more about. Yeah, I, you know, the other <laughs> interesting one and uh, we, we are probably gonna have a, a session on this um, <clears throat> is anticoagulation in the ambulatory space and not anticoagulation that trails the person out of the hospital because they have atrial fib or they were on it in the hospital. But what about uh, de novo high-risk patients uh, who have high D-dimers or fibrin pro split products and so on and so forth? What about those people? There is a national study um, that's a multi-site study that we're actually trying to get ourselves into. Um, but uh, uh, from many of the speakers, we've heard about the thrombotic complications, which sort of go unrecognized. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. So definitely that's, that's another big question that we don't have enough data for. Um, we, we, uh, we will not use that in the protocol. I think we're gonna go on a case by case basis if that will be needed then that will be a totally another discussion or another evaluation. Right. Um, okay, that is absolutely, there was one other question um, that was what, are the, what was the role of care coordination in Dr. Ulrich's respiratory clinic? And uh, Ramsey, do you actually have care coordination? And I'm sure that leads to uh, helping with oxygen, oxygen and pulse oximetry monitoring uh, and home care if needed, but do you actually have those resources available to you? Yes, we do, and we're fortunate to, to have that. And, and actually, really within the last month, <clears throat> um, the care coordination nurse is now co-located with me. And that is really key because I can just walk over to, to him and say, you know, this patient's getting BAM um, and uh, their role was really to actually help coordinate BAM with a physician that we have uh, giving BAM in the PACU of, of, of our local Dignity Hospital um, and making sure that at, that actually happens. And so they have a critical role in making sure if the patient, you know, they, they're, they're consented for BAM, they understand, you know, the potential risks, you know, the exclusion criteria, et cetera. And it's critical to have someone shepherd the patient 
uh, to the BAM infusion, but then afterwards making the phone calls, how are you doing, you know? Um, and so their role was, for me, is really key. And so I'm getting it, these messages in Cerner saying that, you know, the patient um, is feeling better. Um, they, um, you know, they have a home oximeter now uh, because we now have loaner oximeters that, that, the, that the care coordination nurse is, um, is involved in distributing. And so I can't say enough about how key that is. They're a, just a, a wonderful component to, to help manage these patients because this is, you know, this is the, this is kind of the wild west, you know, I mean, we're managing patients at home and we want to make sure that they're not deteriorating. Uh, I'm going to ask two brief qu uh, questions before uh, we uh, um, sign off. And one has to do um, with um, uh, uh, what Dr. Mesher calls a, a limited um, ambulatory oximetry test where the patient walks less, um, uh, less than a six minute walk. Uh, can that be used to monitor folks over time? So we, 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 this is our plan is to monitor patients. You know, patients are gonna be given a log to log in their oximetry three times a day. We're gonna do it at rest and our plan is to do it with, with activity too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, okay. because that could unmask a, a more severe illness than at rest. And uh, the last question, any role, I think this is for Zantac or Famotidine in the outpatient management of these treat patients. Uh, I'm not aware of the literature on that. Um, I wanted to actually have a follow-up comment to what Dr. Shaib just said. Um, having seen now multiple COVID patients in respiratory clinic, uh, these patients can come in uh, and their O2 sac can be 92% just sitting there. And then I ask them to get up on the exam table and it drops to 88 just for that minimal exertion and their pulse will go from 80 to 110. Uh, and so that resting oximeter reading um, is really, I think, it is, is just looking at you know, a moment in time. And, and I agree that that exercise oximetry, this is a nasty disease. And I mean, just with minimal exertion, there's desaturation. R Ramsey, um, one last question. And that is, what do your patients think of this in terms of this kind of more comprehensive approach. Oh, okay. So that is one thing that I forgot to mention. Um, these patients are so grateful, Dr. Greenswag. I mean, they uh, are scared. A number of their family members have died from COVID. Uh, entire households are infected with COVID. And all of a sudden now they're getting daily phone calls from care coordination. They're getting regular video visit follow-up uh, with me and others. Um, patients um, are absolutely ecstatic. And I, I just think that um, I, I've been privileged to be involved in this, in this program and in collaboration. So, and patients, I think are, are the feedback is just fantastic, so. Great. Uh, Tom, any uh, comments or last words or? <laughs> no, just great work. And sorry, I was moving between meetings and listening. So it's just amazing program. Oh. And I just thank, oh. thank you. You know, being thought leaders and driving these programs, you, you teach everybody else how to do this. So thank you. Yeah, thank you both. Uh, just absolutely great. And um, we will um, uh, certainly um, have these presentations and the slides available to everyone. Number one, number two, uh, we, we published the actual Zoom recording and number three, uh, Brooke now has a YouTube channel. So uh, you will you'll be famous, you can be YouTube influencers. So we, we thank you. And actually, you know, I think based on the questions uh, and your comments, there's a few things that we may, uh, you know, that COVID is about change. And I think there's some things we can add to our protocol, social determinants and the like. Uh, but I, I think um, um, this is really well done and we thank you. And um, Dr. Shaib, you're, I've already gotten some uh, tweets and emails. I really like that matrix and that, that mm -hmm. graph. So um, uh, I think that's great stuff that we'll add to our um, protocol. So thank you both. It's just great.